You are tuned to the Nighttime Podcast, focused on the fringe of Canada. Hello, listeners. For tonight's episode, I have a very special guest in what I think is a very fascinating topic. Let me frame the episode like this. I'm from a small island on the east coast of Canada called Cape Breton. The island is known around the world for both its breathtaking shorelines and its access to natural resources. For the people who live on the island, it's this beauty and these resources we turn to for our economy. For as far back as history can take you, inhabitants of Cape Breton Island have found sustenance in our fisheries, our forests, our coal mines, our steel industry, and of course, tourism. All of these industries have brought people around the world to Cape Breton and sent a little bit of Cape Breton all around the world. But one of our island's greatest exports, at least since sometime in the late 90s, will come as a bit of a surprise. One of Cape Breton's residents, an unassuming fella with a smile much bigger than his ego, is responsible for some of the world's biggest songs by some of the world's biggest artists. It's fair to say that Cape Breton's Gordy Sampson was able to send a little bit of Cape Breton Island to more people than our natural industries ever could. And he has the Grammys to prove it. After achieving success in Canada as a solo performer, a singer-songwriter type, Gordy really found his stride in writing songs for others. In fact, stride is probably the wrong word to use. Gordy, who is now based in Nashville, is straight-up songwriting royalty. As it all turned out, his ability to connect clever lyrics with traditional Celtic-inspired melody has made him a go-to for country music's biggest stars. To name just a few, Gordy's songs were recorded by the likes of Willie Nelson, Faith Hill, Keith Urban, Trisha Yearwood, Luke Bryan, Martina McBride, Lady Antebellum, Brad Paisley, Leanne Rhimes, Miley Cyrus, Bon Jovi, and of course, his biggest is probably the Grammy award-winning song, Jesus Take the Wheel, which was recorded and performed by Carrie Underwood. So yeah, it's needless to say, Gordy Sampson has valuable insight and a hell of a lot of stories. So let's get to it. Tonight, in this episode of Nighttime, I'm proud to be joined by Cape Breton's hit maker, Gordy Sampson. Gordy, welcome to the show. I'm so happy to have you here. Hey, Jordan. Thanks for having me, man. So you are um, you are stuck in small town Cape Breton. Is this a, is that a positive thing to be um, pandemic uh, stuck, pandemic stranded? Yeah, I I mean, yes, it is. It's weird. Yeah. It's weird to just you know. It's not weird to be home. It's actually lovely. It's great to be home. Uh, but you know, it's you're not in your own house and you're not in the town you usually work in. And but I mean that that isn't a whole lot different for me than most people right now yeah and you've been um for the last several years you've been living somewhere much warmer than uh the east coast of canada you're uh, you're home from nashville yeah is there much of a difference between the two cities i imagine nashville is a lot more like belt buckles and cowboy boots or is that just the movies i mean you know i think that when people visit nashville now i mean it's easy it's easy to to think that that's what I would think if uh, I was going to Nashville for the first time, but it's it's so much more uh, it's quite a bit more metropolitan than, than it used to be. Uh, you know the restaurant scene and and everything, just like pretty much anywhere is, but Nashville in particular has experienced a uh, like a massive tourism boom, massive real estate boom, all that kind of good stuff. Um, and so you know what that does to a city it, it it sort of everything gets gentrified and expensive and all that kind of stuff so you know a lot of the people that lived in nashville their whole lives that are kind of older are, are, are um and and some of them maybe the more conservative folks are kind of upset because they feel like they're losing their city the old historic building that used to be EMI recording studios gets knocked down and a condo gets put there. And it's just that part of it's kind of sad. Yeah. But um, and I, you know, I've been there 15 years. So 
I feel like I just got there at the end of old Nashville, if you will, and um, and have sort of lived through just seeing a bit of that into the new Nashville. Mm-hmm. But you get to uh, rub elbows with a lot of people from old Nashville. I actually, uh, just the other night, I watched uh, Willie Nelson singing one of your songs at some big, you know, Farm Aid kind of concert. So before we get into talking about your career, uh, why don't you just, like, I I get that the music industry is a complicated business with a whole bunch of moving parts. Why don't you just give me an idea of what your role in the whole thing is? What what are you doing nowadays? I I am primarily a songwriter producer so i'm a songwriter i mean i i i it's uh, first and foremost it it, uh and i've been doing it pretty much full-time since i was really around 30 early 30s it kicked in i'm in my late 40s now but um it's sort of where i ended up uh i had uh, a taste of being a solo artist made some records a couple of records and that was really fun, uh, but you know, realized through that process once I discovered this, which is the thing I'm still doing, that uh, that really felt like what I was, you know, put on the earth to do, and still does. Yeah, and and I, I know a bit of your your background because it's we we grew up in you know in the same kind of scene, like the the music scene in in Cape Breton area. I find I'm surprised that given your place now in the music business, you don't really have a formal background in music. Like, can you tell me how you got into music to begin with? Yeah, I mean, most of that comes from my mom, you know, uh, is very, very musical, still is, still plays shows, teaches music. But when I grew up, her her job um, was playing in a band. So um, when you grow up in that kind of environment, uh, any kind of music as a profession um however big or small is not foreign at all it's what you uh, it's what you know it's what you learn so uh in that sense it was always very natural for me although you know some people ask me you know did I always know I was going to do something with it the answer is no I mean it wasn't that cut and dried I knew that I was going to always play music and be part of it but I wasn't I didn't have uh you know, so much confidence in it that I just knew I was going to do it professionally for, for a living. I mean, I was, you know, but, uh, but luckily I did. And, you know, it's a long, hard road for, for anybody. Um, and a lot of, you have to put in a lot of time and a lot of people give up. And thankfully mine was pretty good. Like it wasn't that it was fairly fast. It, you know, so I'm grateful for that. Yeah. And when I look at your career, it just seems like you see these obvious steps that you, you took throughout your career, which is, I, I think is really, really cool to see. You, I guess you would have cut your teeth in, uh, in the beginning in this, again, in the, like the Cape Breton music scene. And you started as like a, in rock bands, like you're known, you're known now more for country music, but what did you like at that point in your career? Did you have any aspirations to, you know, be a famous performer or anything? Or what was the plan at that point? I mean, it was a dream, uh, but one that was kind of not really within reach. You know, it was like you're kind mm-hmm. of reaching for it, knowing that it's kind of at or, or not or thinking that it's out of your reach. But um, yes, I mean, I, I did start off, uh, you know, I played in high school after high school, I played in cover band for a second and toured the Maritimes, Hmm. uh, and then played with real world for, for a couple of years. Um, and at that time, right at the end, I was, uh, at the end of playing with real world, I, 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 at that time I was discovering Celtic music, uh, in a big way. Hmm. And, uh, and most people that grew up in Cape Breton that, that are, you know, really embedded in the, the cult, the Gaelic culture, fiddle culture, and etc., kind of grow up with it being a big, big part of their lives from the time they're three, you know, step dancing when they're three years old, etc., etc. There was an appreciation for it in my family, but it wasn't that. So I was kind of mm-hmm. discovering Celtic music from ground zero in the back door, basically at 18, 19 years old, and that kind of informed a lot of the journey I had in my twenties. Uh, played with Ashley McIsaac, then. Uh, 
and then for a couple of uh, uh, years, uh, Rita McNeil for a little bit, and the Rankins for a few years. And by the time I got through those things, I was in my late twenties, and the songwriting thing was sort of uh, really becoming very interesting to me, and I was taking that pretty seriously and started going to Nashville had a couple of hits uh in Canada before I went there like bef- with with writing with either the Rankins or Ashley uh, a couple of other bands crush just like people that were in the, the the circuit around the Maritimes and went to Nashville and started uh doing the thing there and uh, that was pretty humble for a year or two until uh, uh, Jesus Take the Wheel happened sort of around there. I'm guessing that changed everything. Well, it, it did. I mean, I, it, a couple of things happened at the same time. Jesus Take the Wheel was one of them. And then I got some pretty major cuts uh, with like Faith Hill and, and Keith Urban and stuff like that. It was all kind of happening at the same time. So it was sort of raining chunky goodness there for a second. And, uh, and that... That changed everything. Yeah, it, it's like, and I'm guessing that that was around the point that you moved to Nashville. I'm, I'm assuming that's, you went there for that opportunity to pursue songwriting full time. Yeah, yeah, I really did. It, now, at that point, I was still one foot in the door and one foot out the door as far as being an artist was. So when I got signed to a publishing deal in Nashville, I would have been around 32 years old, I suppose, at that point. But the the publish the publisher that signed me signed me as an artist to the publishing deal. And what that means is that they felt they would make their money back by me being a star as opposed to me writing for other stars. That's uh, that's a different kind of publishing deal. So that was actually my first one. Uh, but what happened is that I signed there, and uh, I was sort of giving up on being. A, I was becoming less and less interested in being a star, and I hated the road. It's, you know, uh, all that stuff, um, did enough of that in my twenties and, uh, just fell in love with the, the idea of, of being the Nashville songwriter. You, you stay in one place, you work out of a studio, your life is, you, you start at the same time pretty much every day. I mean, it, it had, it had so much, uh, regularity to it. And, uh, you know, it was so much, so unlike the road that it's, it, it really worked for me. Mm-hmm. And now, it, like you, you didn't jump right into songwriting. Were your career as a solo performer, even after Real World, which had some success in Canada, um, doing kind of eighties, late eighties rock, I guess is how I would describe it. After Real World, as you described there, you were touring with well-known Canadian acts, like writing with Ashley, touring with Rita McNeil. Then you did your your solo albums, which were like I guess it's hard for me to tell as like just a civilian watching much music but like your song sorry seemed like a huge hit uh as did sunburn but it it, like it seemed like you were climbing as a performer like was it a big risk to step away from that and be like i'm just gonna write songs for others no not for me but you know it it, it's it's a question you get a lot because uh people uh that you know in various interviews i've done it almost always comes up uh is there a letting go of the songs and your artistry and, and letting other people record your songs? Didn't feel like that to me at all. I mean, it might feel like that to some. As a matter of fact, I know it feels like that to mm-hmm. some. Uh, some people struggle with that. I had zero struggle with that. It's 20 years later, and uh, looking back, I still feel like I have zero struggle with it. Uh, some... Mm-hmm therapist and psychiatrist may pull that out of me that I am struggling with it and don't know it but <laughs> I don't think so yeah that'll be a problem that'll be a problem for a couple of years to figure out yeah yeah um, well it's just when you hear like most like a, a, a famous songwriter often they're not performers like it seems like it's kind of one or the other for a mm-hmm. lot of a lot of people mm-hmm. but it's um like I'm sure a lot of the people you're you're writing with are either basically full-time performers or full-time songwriters and i would think it would be rare for someone to have a a successful career as a performer and then an even more successful career as a songwriter afterwards like is that a Hmm. like a unique trajectory in in that business it's it's fairly unique but not uh not unheard of uh i think of people like in country music like radney foster he would he would have had a career similar to that 
in pop music uh, mm -hmm. like Sia, uh, even mm -hmm. even by some uh, even uh, it's more popular now in pop and hip hop and R and B for for artists to write songs for other artists. Uh, that seems to come yeah. and go in waves, but you know. Ed Sheeran wrote uh, "Love Yourself" for Justin Bieber, and and Sia is a great pop artist and writes all kinds of songs for other folks. And uh, I think that that's uh, just the, the the most natural and organic uh, way to do it. Uh, it gets complicated. It's the business that makes it complicated. It's the business that makes it hard for that stuff to go. We all just we're all just artists that love each other and kind of want to hang out with each other. But you know the uh, uh, it's such a uh, it's such a uh, yeah. strange and wonderful business that there's it gets so complicated you know it was kind of a, a story that happened in uh, where I grew up in uh, Nova Scotia and I, I had a very Catholic aunt that I used to spend a lot of time with she told me a story about um losing control of the car and almost getting in an accident. And uh, she told me how she planned to deal with it. And uh, I just kind of marked it away as a childhood story I heard when I was probably eight or nine years old. And uh, about 20 years later, I was driving again in Nova Scotia past uh, an accident scene where a friend of mine had lost her sister. And this childhood memory kind of popped into my brain. I was on my way to Nashville uh, to write with, with Brett James and Hillary Lindsay and uh, kind of brought in this idea for a song. And it became Carrie Underwood's first single. It's called Jesus Take the Wheel. Uh, Let me introduce you to somebody who really in this country right now needs no introduction. She's country music's female vocalist of the year. <laughs> Number one. Most downloaded song on the iPod. Here is American Idol champion Kelly. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure you get this often. Uh, this is probably the, the number one question you get most often. But Jesus Take the Wheel, I, I know a little bit about the background of the song. So I'm gonna, I'll tell you what I know, but you can fill in the blanks. But what I really want to hear is how the song got to Carrie Underwood and became, you know, what it is now. Like, I, my understanding is you had the idea for the song after hearing a story from, I think, from someone in your family about, you know, a car accident when you're a child later in life, you, you know, you thought of that again, how does that turn into, you know, an American idol taking the song and, you know, winning Grammys and everything else. Tell me the, the story of kind of the life cycle of that tune. Well, that's that part of it. And to be honest with you, I don't exactly know verbatim how that worked. Uh, uh, but, um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I know the story behind the song and, and what you said is basically right. Um, but uh, as far as you, you write the song, then, then you have to make a demo of it, a demonstration of it, and which we did. So now there's a, a, a fake real version of the song going around. So we're demonstrating, the writers are demoing it, pretending to be the artist and saying, hey, artist, you should record this. Here's, a, here's an MP3. And it gets schlepped around like cheese. Um, and that's sort of the, uh, the Nashville traditional way and still really is many things have changed about Nashville but this part of it isn't that ho a whole lot different even now in 2020 um your publisher receives it and goes oh my god this is a great song uh, I'm gonna send this over to Carrie Underwood's A&R person at her label or manager or whatever and it's something like that happened um and that's the sort of semantics of it i guess to a lot of people looking from the outside in but it's interesting to us folks because uh that's that's how it gets done but and sometimes in the case of the last hit i had uh which was a luke bryan song that was a, that was one of the writers texting luke bryan saying hey man have you heard this song and just mp3'd it in a text and five minutes later he goes 
I love this song. I'm going to record it. And that was it. <laughs> it, it, it was that simple. Wow. And you can, but, but there are hundreds and hundreds of, of stories of songs that go to the song cemetery and just die. Uh, for every time I could tell that story, you know, but the, the payoff and, uh, and the glory is pretty great when you have one. And that's why we do it. Cause it's, it's, it, uh, keeps you, keeps you going. Yeah. So with, with Jesus take the wheel, did you like when, when you found out that she was going to perform that song and, you know, make it a single or whatever, I don't, I don't think she was as big, like she had one American idol. Is that, is that where, what her background was? And so this was like her first song coming out of that. It was like, we wrote the song. It sat around for about six months after we wrote it. It was pitched a couple of places. It was pitched to one major, very major female artist in fairness to her. I won't say who it is, but she passed on it. And that doesn't mean anything. It's Ooh. not like you go, ha ha ha. You passed on my song. Like, songs are not just songs are not hits people make them hits right so that artist mm -hmm. felt like i don't think i can make that a hit or that song's not right so you know uh so it got passed by a couple of people and then when it landed in 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 carrie's uh camp uh the um simpatico was there i suppose you know for mm -hmm. the song right song right record right time yeah and uh and it was her first country single yeah and did that like when when that song was done and being passed around, did it to you, did that song feel any different or special? Like, are, were you, did you think it was going to be this like career changing? Nope. Thing. We knew it was good, but, uh, mm -hmm. but it, uh, you know, with, with the word Jesus in the title, you're limiting probably some of your pitches, you know, you'll never get it in a movie if it's got Jesus in the title because it's too on the nose. So like, uh, in, in, in one sense, uh, it was a little bit bold, I guess, in one way. So it, it had sort of a narrow path. Um, it, it, it was, it was very surprising to be honest with you. And, and no, I remember, I remember saying to one of my co-writers is like, is there any luck with that Jesus wheel song? Like, has anybody showed, in, expressed interest in that? I seem to recall that was pretty cool. I mean, it was kind of like that, you know? Hmm. Wow, it, but 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 once it once it's performed and it lands and it's you know you, you get a Grammy, it's the number one country song. Like, what kind of impact does that have on your career? Like, was that for you? Was that like a real turning point, or was that just another step on the road? It was quite a turning point. Like, uh, you know, the benchmark I often use was like at the time I was traveling back and forth from Canada to the U.S. a lot. And I didn't have uh, as good documentation. Like I have a green card now, uh, but at the time, you know, I was on like a, a beginner, an entry level visa, and you get detained at customs all the time because customs guys don't really understand songwriting. They're like, "Well, you're going down to write songs, okay? So you're making money down there?" And it's like, "Well, no, but I mean, if it becomes a hit, I would." And they're and they just like scratching their head. <laughs> they 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 don't know what that means or whatever right so i was constantly getting detained yeah. but once i wrote jesus take the wheel then uh the, you know the border guards would be like okay so you write songs any any i know and i'll be like i wrote that jesus take the wheel song he's like you gotta be kidding me that's my mother's favorite song and it's like so that was kind of, that was the most <laughs> that was kind of one of the most that was uh, the big difference yeah like go ahead go ahead have fun write another <laughs> hit there kid all right <laughs> I, every so often I watch um, this. There's like a show on TV, like border control kind of thing where it's like it's like a reality show where they have cameras in the airports. And it's often people trying to get out of the in and out of like um, international flight to Canada. And they'll go through their bags looking for things and making sure they're not working here. So I just I picture the scene where it's Gordy Sampson trying to explain he's going down to Nashville to write songs. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was it wasn't far from that. Once that song hits you're then established as a songwriter for hire in Nashville, I'm assuming. Cause it's when I look at your credits, it's like after that, your songwriting credits, I see all the big names, even people performing some of your, your old songs from your solo career. Like uh, you or somebody like you it was a hit you had as a solo performer. And then I think it was like Faith Hill did it or not Faith Hill. Um, Keith Urban uh, cut that yeah. one. Yeah, so there was a bit of that, and then Faith Hill cut a, 
a song called Paris that was on a record of mine. So some of the, as I was, as I said before, with one foot out the door and one in, in the artist and writer world, you know, the thing that was sort of helping me make that decision was even though I was doing records, I was getting some of the cuts I was starting to have happen with other um, touring artists were, were being cut right off of my record. So there wasn't, we didn't make a demo of Paris. They just heard the record and they were like, well, that guy, you know, he's kind of a, an indie artist who's never kind of exploded. Like this, it's okay to cut this song. No one's heard it yet. And they were, they were right. Essentially in the big picture, no one had. So that was, that was kind of informing the transition, if you will. Yeah. In a, and I saw Miley Cyrus did one of your old tunes as well. Yeah. Well, that's a different kind of thing. That's like that. We wrote that in LA. So that would be Hillary Lindsay, who, uh, you know, is, uh, very grateful to get all the time I can with Hillary. She's a, one of my best friends and certainly the person I've wrote, written more songs with than anyone else. But she, uh, she and I, and John Shanks, uh, an, an LA producer wrote that song and he was producing Miley Cyrus at the time. So okay. that that's a little bit different. You get a call from John Shanks going, Hey, I'm just in the studio with Miley Cyrus and uh, I played her the song she wrote. She really likes it. She wants to maybe write a bridge for it or change a couple of lines. And at that point you go from three writers on the song to four. And, uh, and that's, no big deal uh one of them is the artist that's going to cut your song so you know only if only a fool would pass on that at the time uh, you know in, in that moment uh so so that that's just a, a more unusual way to get on the record but uh that happens yeah. things but like it, that in pop music a little bit more yeah i, I want to hear about kind of the the process of putting the song together with an artist because that's something i think as a as a outsider we're completely ignorant with and I think I got a glimpse of it when uh, I watched a documentary recently about um, one of my favorite of your songs, my favorite picture of you uh, that you co-wrote for or with Guy Clark. There's um, a performance of, of of Guy Clark, who's like this legendary country western Nashville guy. Um, in in the I call it a documentary, but really it's like a five minute piece where he'll eventually perform the song, but he tells the background of the song and you know, the picture of his wife. And, and he mentions, you know, I, I was with this uh, songwriter I had just met named Gordy Sampson. And it sounds like the way he describes it, he made it sound like you were kind of just pitching ideas. And one of the ideas was my favorite picture. And he said, yeah, that sounds great. Like, is it, is that how it works? You just have ideas for songs and you go to an artist or do you have like half finished or completed songs or is it different all the time? It can be different all the time. Uh, there, there are various ways to approach it and various instruments, if you will, of uh, mm -hmm. when I say, you know, tools. Uh, when one, one of the ones that's really popular and age old in the country tradition, especially, uh, although all kinds of pop songs get written like this too and other uh, genres as well. Uh, is just is is what we call writing from the title, and that is really just exactly what it sounds like. That that mean you walk into a room, and all I have to if you're Guy Clark Jordan, all I have to offer you is mm -hmm. an idea to write a song called "My Favorite Picture of You." I might at that time I didn't know what it meant. Who's in the picture? Who is it sung by a girl? Is it fast? Is it slow? I know nothing, but it's one way to to write a song. I'm guilty of writing songs from the title almost every single time. Um, it, just because it's sort of my comfort zone. But uh, it's not the only way to do it. Uh, sometimes I forget there's other ways, and it's actually quite refreshing to, you know, you might bring in a guitar riff or something. And, and, uh, but, uh, but when you, when you start to think like a songwriter and you do it every day, I think what happens is, the title becomes the anchor for the song and um, it anchors it down. So everything revolves around that. And um, it's not mm -hmm. uncommon for me to say, you know, if we're writing something and we got a verse, but we don't know what the chorus is yet, I get stumped. I, I can't, I, I actually will, will kind of get blocked until I know what the song's called. I, I kind of breathe or not necessarily what it's called, but what, what, uh, 
I shouldn't say what what it's called, but what what the course does and what the uh, aha moment is at the end of the course that makes you, you know, mm-hmm. dance or 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 make love or cry or whatever the hell you would need to or do. Or all three. <laughs> At the same time, which I highly yeah. recommend. Yeah, that song's called "Wild Night." Um, <laughs> the uh, with a, my favorite picture of you—that's one where, like, I can now that you explain that, I can almost see how you wrote it from the title because it's, you know, what the name of the song. That is the song. It's describing one's favorite picture of another person, and it just so happened that when you pitched that to Guy Clark, it must have just been the right title the right guy who just happened to have like a photo of his wife who was in in ill health right Mm -hmm. there and it just like was that as magical of a moment as it seems to me when i hear the story be told yes it's pretty it's pretty magical and it's one of those things where you know there's no formula to this there's no formula to magic but uh there's there's a there's a great quote about magic that eludes me right now but it's something to you know if if you keep if you just keep doing it, you're going to stumble on magical moments, right? It's not like you can just sit down and um, and these are the kind of moments you 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 live for. And uh, but when you do this all your life, they they happen more frequently. And the more you do it, and uh, the you know, I guess it's sort of like the idea of success inviting success. You know, the you you, you the more you do it the more you it's like the law of attraction you you sort of attract maybe these moments i mean i'm i'm not trying to get metaphysical about it but i'm just saying you know it's it's you're going to experience those moments more Hmm. when you do when you do this all the time yeah like do you feel like as someone who you don't have like a formal background in songwriting it's not like you went to like some special english school or something for songwriting i don't know if there's even schools for that but do you like do you feel despite your success and everything do you feel like you're like good at it or do you feel like you're just kind of <laughs> winging it every time and it's working i'm just trying like i'm trying to imagine how it must feel to be able to just have a string of of hits with and have maintained a you know a, a forward momentum all this time like what what is it that's making this work for you so well yeah i mean i think you do you uh, you you do have a sense that you're good at it. You you have to. I mean, uh, it would be so uncomfortable otherwise. I mean, you can't you can't be ter- you can't be too confident. It's like uh, so many other things in in this world. If you walk into a writing situation with uh, you know all kinds of hubris, like you're just gonna <laughs> it might not work out for you. Because it, you know, it. Yeah. Willie Nelson's not changing the bridge. I wrote this bridge. Yeah, you you yeah. do get comfortable in your skin, and because it's when you start out right, it's 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 scary. Like I, I uh, have been lucky enough to do uh, for the last ten years a song camp for young Nova Scotian writers. You know, with with my manager yeah. Sherry, and uh, and uh, that's been that's been just so incredible to sort of relive what those that first uh those first feelings are like it's it's scary it really is co-writing is scary i mean it's it's uh it's so judgy and songwriters by and large we're we're uh usually a little more anxious than normal by nature and uh hate being judged even more than the average person but it's also the thing that makes us better and uh, and uh, it's part of the way we're wired. Uh, how does the like the co-writing a song like when I, when I think of a songwriter, and I think when a lot of people think of one, they picture like this poet type, like in a dark room alone, you know, working away at something all through the night. But when I look at your credits for a lot of the songs you wrote, th- there's like four or five people in some cases. I just I other than in a band setting and I, I don't I don't know if that's how you do it but like how do how does that collaboration happen well um, for me they're typically that yes they can be groups of four or five sometimes two never one I haven't written a song by myself in ages you know pre 2000 it would be in the 90s would be somewhere would be the last time I wrote a song wow. by myself so you know once you start talking about collaborative writing that's a, it's like sort of sub sub form or sub art form you know of writing songs which is has its own dynamic 
But yes, um, most of the time it's three people because that seems to be the lucky number. There's like a, there's a dynamic to, to three people that works. Uh, four people is almost like can be too many cooks. Um, it depends on who the personalities are, but you, uh, you have to be not scared to have ideas. So if you think about it, uh, I'm trying to think of an example. Let's say you and I right now were tasked with the job of coming up for coming up with, uh, with a, uh, advertisement scheme for Nissan. I'm just pulling that off the top of my head. And so we're, you know, we're writing their, uh, their campaign, their, you know, their television commercial, everything. Songwriting is really not that, it's one molecule away from that. It's almost the same thing, I think. I've never done the other, but from what I understand. So if we were doing that, you know, you and I would be the collaborators. And right off the bat, you have to be not scared at all to say whatever comes to your mind. We call it dare to suck. And, um, and it's kind of a deal you make with yourself. And the other partner realizes that you're in a very exposed and naked situation. I, let's say by other partner, I mean, I let's say you were going to say whatever's on your mind. I realize that this is uh, a situation that's you're putting your soul on the line. Uh, so therefore, it's my duty to not judge you too much. And my body language needs to encourage you. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, that's... You know, if you start writing that tw songs at 20, by the time you're 21, it's second nature. I mean, it doesn't take long for it to become second nature at all. But it is uh, it is a hump, a hurdle that you do have to get over. Mm -hmm. But a small group of people can't do it or they give up on it. And I'm, I'm not sure why that is. It must be a personality trait that just makes it a little harder. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it'd definitely be like a check your ego at the door kind of thing. Like when, despite you having hits and, you know, and the other artists maybe being like a well-known performer or something like that, like all that has to stay outside the, the writing room or I guess it would never work. Yes, that's right. Like you and you, you also could be, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a, I might have a, a star in the room for a day. Like, let's say Charles Kelly from Lady Annabella. I'm just pick that off my head because. I was just texting with him earlier about a song, but you know, let's say he's in the room and I'm writing with him for the first time. He's a star. I'm like a, just a, a, a peasant songwriter by comparison. Okay. But your, my job is to not be a yes man. You, you have to be on level playing field. So you have to, you have to forget the other person's notoriety. They're there to benefit from you. And you have to be a hundred percent of what you what you can be. I mean, you you can't feel like you're really any less. You can't feel like you're any more either. But you don't. You know what I mean? It has to be has to be a level playing field, and uh, you can't be there. Oh, Charles, that's gr oh yeah, man. Oh, I love what you just said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, if you sit there and do that, like you, <laughs> that's just not. I mean, you might get something good if you're lucky, but I, I wouldn't count on it. You know? Yeah. But that, that must be hard to do. And like, I know um, I've been watching a lot of your old videos earlier. So I know there was probably a point in your life where you were really into Bon Jovi. Uh, some of the real world videos look a little bit like early Bon Jovi. <laughs> uh, I definitely was definitely was into some hair bands. Not Bon Jovi, though. I, no. I got to say, no, I've never I, I, I eventually. Anyway, you go. You, you talk. But I, I, you got me thinking now. <laughs> Uh, maybe that's more. There's one clip in particular I watched. It was a real world performance. I think you're in. It was maybe in New Brunswick or something. But uh -huh. just the way Jamie folds the singer at the time, the way he performed and stuff. I just I really got like a Bon Jovi vibe to it. But uh, but I know you eventually went on to co-write at least one song with Bon Jovi. Like to, yeah, I just couldn't imagine sitting in a room with someone like like that or you know like Keith Urban like that to see them as a like a regular person with all the lights and cameras stripped away. Like that must, that must take a bit, especially as like a small town yeah. guy from Cape Breton. Like I remember, uh, I talked to your buddy, Ashley McIsaac about this. I ran into him once at the mall and I was like falling over myself to see like, you know, such a star. 
but to be in like a to be with these kind of people like that's the real deal yeah it is and it doesn't happen every day obviously right but that that is uh you know looking back the there's some great uh great moments that you get to hang with people like that but it's it's no surprise that they're just people they're just dudes uh and 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 in the case of bon jovi that i do remember being a little bit anxious i normally don't get too nervous about a co-write like that but the bon jovi one was just a little a little bigger than your average one and uh i met them at a hotel in down nash in downtown nashville and went up to the room and uh, i had my sunglasses on in the middle of the day it took me i kind of wasn't taking them off in the room because i think my anxiety level was was uh a little higher than usual but <laughs> it uh I kind of sat down with uh, John, and I had heard all the. You hear all these stories about, oh, he's such an asshole, and he this and that, and you have all these predis predispositions for them, and that one of the fun thing is that usually all that stuff is just dead wrong. You know, I wrote a song with him and Richie. I think Richie was yeah. divorcing somebody in the next hotel room, so he wasn't in the room much, but he would pop in and out. But uh, it was mostly John and I, and at one point I still smoked cigarettes at the time, and I was like. I just I'm croaking for a cigarette. Do you mind, guys? I'll be right back. I'll I'll be. And John's like, "Oh, screw it. We'll just hang one out the window." So, and I wish I had a picture of it. So there's a little tiny window where John John's. I didn't know he smoked. So we both of our heads, and of course my head is. Uh, you know I've got enough head for the whole band on my shoulders here. So I don't know how it even fit. But the two of us were uh, hanging out the little window smoking trying not to get caught in the hotel and we wrote a cool song it's the only time i wrote with them and they and they cut it it was great <laughs> yeah that's that's awesome You've wrote so many songs through your career for so many different people and for yourself. Are there any songs in particular that are like, you know, your most precious babies? Yeah, I mean, often they're the they're, they're often uh, ones that never get cut, and uh, um, that's a that's a great question. I, I I I would think if we sat down and had a beer and I was playing a couple of songs and you asked me that, I would probably play you a couple of things that you've never heard and really no one else in the world has either but me and the the, the the writers and i that wrote it it's it's one of our favorites interesting but yeah it's, it really seems like no matter how good the songs are you really need to find the right person you know for in the right time for it to be a match just like uh my favorite picture with guy clark like the that's just like lightning in a bottle to find uh him yeah. to sing that song was so perfect and then I mentioned this earlier, but then Willie Nelson is put it on an album now as well, and I think he's doing really well with it. Yeah, it did. It did really well. I mean, the the uh, the irony with with that is that you know, uh, the 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 songs I want to write and uh, kind of same with anybody I write with, they'll tell you some version of the same thing. What we want to write is is something we can use our craft on, and some and something that uses all of the things and wisdom and, and emotions and feelings and everything we've accrued over time. What country music asks us to write is a completely different thing. Okay. So you, you know, you, so what happens is that most of us spend most of the time writing songs that are too cool for school. They're, they're, they're often uh, not, I'm not saying my own songs are cool, but they, they fail at becoming a radio hit because um, that target market is soccer moms dropping their kids off at school at 8.30. So they don't want to hear my favorite picture of you. They want they want to bop to something or they, they want a ditty, right? So it's kind of like spending your whole life learning how to paint, you, you know, the most Van Gogh or Monet-inspired paintings you can and then getting a job painting by numbers. So you can't actually use the skills, you know, so, so, and that I like, it's not a bad thing. It's just, it is what it is. Um, yeah. And so you're constantly reminding yourself of that. Interesting. Um, I'm sure throughout your career, you would have been 
to some pretty strange like writing sessions and weird events and stuff like is there anything that stands out there any stories you can share of some of the more memorable kind of writing sessions or performances or whatnot that you had gosh i'm really bad for for (laughs) being put on the spot uh there are so many i can't (laughs) think of one i know that's a terrible answer but well you wrote with Ashley McIsaac. I'm sure you could probably list any night with Ashley. It, Ashley was definitely a, that. That was a trip. I mean, I I I enjoy. I love Ashley. I don't get to see him very often, and yeah. and uh, I I got a nice hang in with him last summer at the Gala College, just randomly. And uh, Ashley's just he's so bright. Um, I, I, mind you, you know he's over there on I don't know on the far side of one of the sides, but. Uh, nevertheless he he knows he knows what's going on um but yeah you know when i play with him of course would have been the uh the early days and the and the craziest part like i did the first like two years i was there really almost from day one with ashley like for his first gig and uh and then i i lasted for about a year or two and then and then he went on to do even bigger shows. Like his thing really blew up after that. Uh, and and mind you, it it burned hot and it burned fast, but it did. It was really big. Uh, I was already I was kind of out of the band by then. It was just that that like you know that burned too hot even for me. <laughs> so <laughs> he was on my show. Did you hear his uh, when he was on? You know, I didn't. I have listened to almost every one of your episodes, by the way, Jordan. So I, I hope next time oh, we do awesome. this, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna I have a bunch of things to interview you about. So maybe we can talk about that anytime. But uh, I haven't heard I haven't I haven't heard that yet. I haven't heard the Ashley okay, one yet. Uh, Ashley got pretty weird, I'll tell you. <laughs> so uh, so what's next for you? Um, well, you know, we're th- thriving through the pandemic here, uh, which is, it's, it's bizarre that, uh, that we're, we, we've been in, uh, Cape Breton now for six months. So it's been a long time since I've been home that much. It's been wonderful. You know, we'll go back to Nashville. We're just going to sort of see how it goes in the new year. My daughter's in school here now. Uh, so we're not moving back, but we've, we've just, you know, if come March, it it it's sort of safe to go back. You know, it's not just we're not just here because it's not safe in Nashville. That's just part of it. Like for people that do what I do, um, we're we're so used to collaborating in person. It none of us have ever collaborated via Skype or Zoom or or anything really. I, I haven't. I mean, some writers probably have, but. Uh, before the pandemic and now it's now it's every day now it's what I you know the very program that we're using right now is what I write songs on every day and it's very challenging uh musicians will appreciate this because because of the latency okay so you know if you Jordan if you pick up a guitar right now and strum it and I pick up a guitar and strum it you know what happens um you know there's a second half a uh, Mm -hmm. half a second or quarter whatever it is tenth of a second is 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 way too much. Wow. Uh, delay be- between, uh, so that makes collaborating uh, impossible. And and uh, you would think that in our day and age that there'd be software and uh, things that would overcome that, but you'd be amazed. You'd be amazed that there's not. It, it's, it really comes down to everyone's personal internet connection and yeah. things like that. Um, so that's been a challenge to write with, with, with that that little tenth of a second or half second, whatever it is, delay, um, is like losing a limb, <laughs> kind of, when you're writing. I, I'm sorry to be dramatic, but yeah. Yeah, but it could be hard enough to have a conversation. Just as you hear now as we talk, it's like you'll finish a sentence and, you know, by the time I start talking... Uh, you're not hearing me start yet, you know. So it's it's hard enough to have a conversation. But when you're talking about playing together in time and harmonizing, like, yeah, I can't even imagine that. But I guess um, for a lot of people, this is going to be like every job has found a way to transition temporarily to, you know, Skype and Zoom and all this stuff. So I guess you're probably not the only songwriter who's uh, who's struggling through this, but um Hopefully it'll be okay. Yeah, it's it's it it's it feels I feel guilty calling it a struggle because I'm 
you know, I'm pretty lucky to do what I do, but it's, it's just, you just didn't see it coming. So you, 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 nav, you, you navigate around it, you know. But this is why you moved to Nashville to begin with, because you could never have what you've done with your career. You could never have done this remotely, you know, by phone or anything. You you need to be there to be networking and to be able to show up at the hotels with Bon Jovi. That's right. And some people are like, you know, well, now that we're so used to Skyping all the time, maybe we'll all just do that more, you know, once the pandemic's over. I mean, I doubt it. I highly doubt it. I mean, we are, we will be so sick of that. I mean, you, if you, if I, I, I mean, I would punch somebody if they want, ask me to write on Skype after the pandemic. So, I mean, I just, I want to close the, everyone's going to close the chapter on that, but uh, it's, it's been just fine. Uh, you know, the music business has taken a, is taken a big hit, a big wallop and, 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 uh, even the movie business, uh, there's lots of things in the news this week about, well, certainly in the theater side, you know, any, any, the live, comp the, where people gather, any component of any business where people gather is really starting to, uh, to get hit hard. So this is going to be, this is going to be interesting coming out of this, you know, yeah, like, but like so many other businesses, it's not like we're alone. Yeah, but for, um, for what you do as like a songwriter and helping artists get their songs put together, it seems like this could be like an opportunity because I, I, I would imagine that a lot of artists are using this time to focus on recording and getting ideas together. Like, would this be a busy time for you or is everything shut down even on, on your side of things? No, it's really busy. It, 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 I, I'm really busy. I'm busier than, I mean, normally I, I kind of take a, like a month off in the summer. I didn't even take that off. I mean, I kind of wound down a little bit because, you know, once the Cape Breton summer gets going, I mean, nobody wants to work, right? But uh, <laughs> you, you got your hours in, so you got your hours in in Nashville, so you're on EI all summer. No, no, yeah. I'm just like trying to bum my way on a boat somewhere. It's like, hey, I got a guitar, a nice boat. <laughs> but like, uh, so uh, the uh, it's been it's been really, uh, really busy. Um but uh, and and my side of it, thankfully, hasn't took taken a direct hit. the pe The people that that depend on live income, um, the the one thing I will say is that I think for anybody that does this or what what I do, like if you're if you have a bunch of downtime, and uh, you know I'm not trying to tell you what to do or anything, but I think it's inevitable that you, you have to realize that when we come out of this, the ball will bounce back up and it'll bounce back really hard. And, um, mm -hmm. everybody is going to be really good. Everybody has learned how to do everything on their, everybody has bought them that didn't have a microphone and didn't know how to make a beat before the pandemic now knows how to do that. And, uh, it's going to be really competitive coming out of it. Um, you know, if you're a songwriter producer, for example, where, where you were the only guy in town, if you were one in 50 that did it, you're going to be maybe one in 10 now or something or mm. one in five, you know, it's yeah. like, uh, it, it's something to, it's something to keep, keep in the back of your mind. I think that, but, and, and then anybody oh, yeah. that kind of isn't using that time to get better at, at their craft and their skills may find that they're, you know, myself included that the you just get maybe on the back of the bus a little bit coming out of it yeah well it's the same with podcasting what the the kind of the joke we've had is that um you know do you know what the cerb is yes mm -hmm. that's like the government benefit people the joke is that the biggest sponsor of podcasts in 2020 has been the cerb yeah because so many people are off work and they're like i'll start a you know a crime podcast yeah with my wife while we're you know yeah. off work so it's uh there's a, there's a lot a lot of that sort of thing going on, but uh, one one last question I want to ask, and no this problem. is something I've always wondered about about songwriting, the order the names appear in, like if you know if this song uh, Jesus Take the Wheel by and it will list all the credits, like the order of the names, does that have like that involves ownership or whatever of the song? That's, a, that's what a great question. I mean, I've never had that question. I've never even thought about it. I don't think. I mean. <laughs> I don't think there's, I mean, it's typically ladies first, uh, I would say. So, uh, usually, um, the lady or ladies in the room are credited first. 
and um, and there's probably a degree of whoever the name is that's most recognizable, you know, uh, maybe is is thrown in there first. I mean, I get that. That's just. But but other than that, Jordan, I don't think, to my knowledge, anyway, there's really a rhyme or reason to it. Okay, I, I always wondered if that had like you know the had to do with like the percentage of ownership or something because kind of the I don't know if this is a, a commonly passed around myth or whatever, but I've just heard stories of like artists maybe um, like a performer who would have a small amount of input on the actual songwriting but would want like to be the main credited writer like is that a common thing in in your world to deal with that sort of thing yeah it it does it does happen with some artists i mean you know uh and you must realize too that it's often not the artist that's causing that it's the people around the artist that like for example beyonce was famous for you know jordan if you and i wrote a song right now let's say and by you know, somehow it found its way to Beyonce's camp and they're like, oh, she loves it. She wants to record it. She'll record it if she takes 50% of it. You guys take 25% of it each. So you're kind of like, you know, half of you is butthurt and the other half is like, well, you can't, you can't turn this down, right? So, because you, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take or whatever. But the... Uh, what but what you must realize is that this is not coming from Beyonce. This is coming from some uh, greedy publisher that speaks on her behalf, or 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 maybe a manager or yeah. something. So, uh, so these artists will, you know, kind of get a bad rap for this when they they they're not even aware it's happening. Yeah, probably. it's just uh, I guess a part of the business, and yeah, but. And on your like on the songwriter's end, it would have to be a business decision as well. Where it's you know, I'm sure the artists who, uh, whose management or whatever would behave that way would be artists that can have the clout to do it or the the name to do it. But yeah, yeah, you know, it it it, it in my experience and everybody else that I talked, I, you know, it it's amazing how it doesn't happen. Like pe- people are good people. The people that. Uh, by and large, you know, so anybody that f- for for you to get from all the way to the bottom to all the way to the top in country or pop, you kind of have to be a certainly in country. Uh, I know less about other genres, but you kind of can't do it if you're not a good person. It won't work <laughs> like if you'll get uh, it's important to be good. And, and, and once and it, you can get a reputation really fast if you're kind of pulling stunts like that and. Uh, Mm-hmm. Uh, it it has a way of weeding out the the good the good folks from the bad folks. Fortunately, yeah. is there if you could pick any artist to write for, is there someone who would be like your your dream gig to write for? Other than ACDC, man, I love ACDC. <laughs> They're the best. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It, it was it's always been a bucket list thing to just be a little bit drunk in the audience for an ACDC show and just be that guy, you know, and I don't know, I might've missed my, I don't, I don't know if we're going to get that now, but uh, I just want to just be, you know, 14 again for a day. I mean, I won't, I won't feel 14 the next day, but the, uh, (laughs) I don't know. I'm, um, there's just so many, there's so much music that I love and some of it's, old and i grew up with it and some of it came out last week and uh but i'm 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 actually a pretty massive pink floyd fan i always have been that's kind of the one band that like from 12 years old till right now that i have not wavered on Uh, i watched yet another documentary on them last night so just because that's fresh in my mind i would take I would take a co-write with uh, David, David Gilmore, Gilmore or Roger. Roger Waters would be more dramatic, I'm sure. Um, yeah. He'd be bossier, I would think. And, and you know, he'd be weirder and just <laughs> selfish. And But, I, of course, I'd do it. And David Gilmore, I yeah. think, would, would probably... I, I have it in my head. He'd be completely the opposite. He'd be like an English gentleman and very... Uh, but I don't know. Who knows? 
Well, the funny thing is, like, just now with you saying that, I could see you really working, your style working great with both those 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 fellas. But maybe they're listening to this podcast and this will be the break. I would love to make that happen. I'm sure they're listening to it or their people might be. Yeah. I, I Well, wouldn't that be wonderful? Yeah. <laughs> That would that would be let's, amazing. Let's end on that. Well, <laughs> Gordy, I can't thank you enough for all this time. It's it's uh, most people would never have the opportunity to talk to someone in your position, and so I thank you so much for uh, giving me so much of your time and being uh, so open with uh, an industry that very few people know much about. It's my pleasure, Jordan. I'm a, I'm a big fan of your show, uh, actually, and uh, I've I. It's not uncommon for me to listen to it at night when I go to sleep I'm just about out of episode so uh, it's okay, well, it's it's it truly is an honor you'll hear a familiar voice in the next one it's going to be weird when you're sleeping to this <laughs> yeah <laughs> Before I wrap this up, I want to give a huge thank you to Gordy Sampson for taking the time out of his night to talk to me and for admitting publicly that he listens to Nighttime. Gordy, you're truly the best. And with that, I'm going to begin wrapping up this episode. But before I do, I'm going to end with thanks. A huge thank you to XNIMVN for providing the musical score for this episode. It's called Sunny Day, and it heavily samples the classic Italian song, Non Dimenticar. Also, a big thank you to downtown Sydney's newest and best bookstore. It's called On Paper Books. And if you're looking for something to get lost in during the holiday, check out On Paper Books. It's on Charlotte Street. And lastly, a massive thank you to everyone who listens to Nighttime. Without your interest and your support, Nighttime would be as pointless as it would be impossible. But with that said, keeping the show alive is and has always been an uphill battle. So if you want to help take some of the weight off the show's shoulders, please subscribe to the premium feed. Not only will it keep the show moving, it'll give you more of each topic than you're going to find on the free feed, as I'm adding exclusive content to the premium feed weekly. So for about the price of a cup of coffee, help keep the show alive by subscribing to the premium feed at patreon.com slash nighttime podcast. And having said that, let me thank the newest supporters of the show. Bev Boy Ketty, Lisa Yutko, and Caitlin McLean. Thank you all for your generous support. And for anyone else out there who'd like to support the show but can't help financially, you can give me a big hand by simply sharing the episodes on social media and telling your friends who you think would be interested in what we're doing here. And if any of you have any story ideas or if you want to give feedback on the show, you can reach me at nighttimepodcast.com slash contact. I'm also on social media. I use Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And I'm live on YouTube every Tuesday, Thursday, and Sunday night at 9 Eastern. And one last thing before we go. If you want to provide your thoughts on this episode, please send me a voice memo. I'll air your comments and answer any questions you have on the next Nightcap Post Show episode. Again, you can reach me and send me that voice memo at nighttimepodcast.com slash contact. So until next time, take care of each other, hug your loved ones tight, and go check out some of Gordy's tunes. The Nighttime Podcast is written, hosted, and produced by Jordan Bonaparte. Copyright Jordan Bonaparte. This is my favorite picture of my wife, Susanna. Me and Towns were in that house, drunk on our ass, being totally obnoxious, you know, and just she'd finally had enough and just said, fuck you guys, I'm leaving. And I think John Lomax was outside and he took that picture of her. A new song, a songwriter I had not met before came over named Gordy Sampson. And he, had written that idea down, my favorite picture of you. And I saw it and read it, or he said it, and I immediately snapped to that photograph because it was pinned to my wall right over there. It was just like, I know this whole song. My favorite picture of you is the one where you stare straight into the lens. It's just
they pull a road shot, somebody took on the spot, no beginning, no end. It's just a moment in time, you can't have back, you never left, but your bags were packed, just in case. My favorite picture of you is painted and it's faded and it's pinned to my wall. Yeah, and you were so angry, it's hard to believe that we were lovers at all. A fire in your eyes, heart on your sleeve, curse on your lips. But all I can see is beautiful My favorite picture of you Is the one where your wings are shown Yeah, your arms are crossed Your fists are clenched You're not gone but gone Stand up, angel, won't back down. You were nobody's fool, you were nobody's clown. Yeah, you were smarter than that. Into the 